Thank you, Bianca, for that kind of introduction. It's, uh, it's nice to be here in Luxembourg, my first time uh, at this conference and in, uh, uh, and in Luxembourg, so I'm happy to be here. Um, as Bianca said, I'm currently a press officer with the North American Animal Liberation Press Office, uh, where I've served since 2004, um, when Dr. Best and I, Stephen Best, uh, formed the press office in response to unfavorable press media that was going on after an ALF, uh, Animal Liberation Front Raid at the University of Iowa. Um, nobody there was uh, speaking on behalf of the animals or the animal liberators, uh, and so we decided to form the press office to do that. <clears throat> Since then, we've strived to present the viewpoint of animal liberators in the mainstream media to counter the opinions of those who abuse animals for uh, profit or pleasure. Today, I would like to review some of their various pathways, uh, tactics, and strategies that have been and are utilized in the struggle for animal liberation. I'll mention some only briefly as they have been discussed at length uh, by others, but I'll elaborate more fully on grassroots activism and uh, activism that utilizes pressure campaigns and illegal direct action. A lot of us start out attempting to educate those who exploit, abuse, and kill animals, thinking that once they know what's going on in vivisection laboratories or slaughterhouses or fur farms, um, they'll stop supporting those atrocities, and some will. Uh, most people in the world will say they oppose wearing fur coats when they're educated about the cruelty involved in trapping, caging, and killing wild animals to make a fashion statement. That's why the fur trade is on the ropes and the vast majority of people don't wear fur anymore and most designers don't even deal in it. Likewise, many, even most people, are opposed to torturing and killing animals in laboratories when they are shown that the data obtained is almost always useless and that there are much more effective, efficient, and economic ways to get even better data on drug and product uses and toxicity. We've heard some about that here in previous talks. Uh, regardless, due to continued government and industry support, vivisection continues and millions of animals die miserable deaths at the hands of so-called scientists and researchers, and educating the public alone is unlikely to change that. But in other areas of animal abuse and exploitation, such as the consumption of animal flesh as food, most people, even when shown the horrors of factory farming and slaughterhouses, will choose to ignore the suffering of animals in order to continue their current lifestyle. Although groups like Anonymous for the Voiceless and their Cube of Truth and Vegan Outreach and many other groups have educated millions of people, and although many of those people have chosen to become vegan, most people, and I personal opinion, it's at least 80%. Most people just don't care enough to make what they see as a radical change in their lifestyle. That's not to say we shouldn't keep trying to educate, but that the effectiveness of education alone in helping most animals is limited and takes generations to achieve minimal, meaningful results. Meanwhile, more animals suffer and die every single year. Many people have worked on legislation to uh, long and hard to get laws passed to protect animals. Most of these laws uh, do little other than to codify animal abuse into the legal system, have done little or nothing to decrease the number of animals dying or their degree of suffering to any major extent, <clears throat> and often exist to allow the abusers to say they've done their part in legalizing their profit. That's not to say that passing laws can never be effective. Many municipalities and even a few countries have outlawed circuses with animals, uh, for example, costing these profiteers serious money and even putting some of them out of business. Israel just recently outlawed the sale and use of most fur products. Um, Austria has outlawed fur farms uh, many years ago. But often a new law, after years in the passing and thousands of hours of work and millions of dollars in resources, then takes years to be implemented and gives the abusers and profiteers enough time to overturn it or water it down so much as to make it useless in saving animals. In many instances, attempts to use legislative, legislative agencies to protect animals are an inefficient, at least, way of achieving animal liberation. And enforcement of the law, even when it's passed, is rarely a priority when it comes to protecting animals. Going to demonstrations is widely seen as an effective means of helping animals, and I will discuss in a moment when done strategically and in sustained fashion can be very effective. They don't cost much, and anyone can organize one um, or participate in one. 
They can serve educational purposes in, additional, in addition to imparting pressure on the animal abusers. If and when they get media attention, for example, that education and pressure can be multiplied many times over. Civil disobedience, <clears throat> which involves overtly breaking the law to make a point, can increase the chance of media coverage, but it also comes at a cost, including one, fiscal risk to the activist, two, legal expenses, and other sequelae of being arrested, and three, risk of subverting the message when focus is shifted to the activist and not to the animals. What I don't think is particularly effective is untargeted, diffuse demonstrations against varying targets, such as targeting a particular grocer or butcher on one weekend, and maybe a McDonald's or another restaurant on another weekend, and maybe a fur store on a day after that. The abusers, in this case, can easily endure the occasional disruption to their business and even bad publicity and continue to profit from their animal exploitation. A special category of demonstration, though, is utilized as part of the pressure campaign, which can be very effective and which I'll now go into a little bit more. Pressure campaigns against animal abusers have been used for many years. Uh, to my knowledge, they originated in the United Kingdom in the late 1990s when activists targeted a uh, breeder called Consort Kennels, which bred beagles for vivisection. After a sustained and relentless campaign of 10 months, the kennel closed and the remaining dogs were released to homes found for them by the activists. The activists next chose Hillgrove Cat Farm, which bred cats for vivisection, and after a two-year focus campaign by activists, that company too closed down. Learning from these successes, the UK activists then decided to focus on the largest private animal testing company in Europe, Huntington Life Sciences. The so-called SHAT campaign for Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty was built upon five separate undercover investigations that had been done into the company and had yielded video footage of horrific animal abuse of dogs, cats, and non-human primates all subjected to inhumane and demeaning treatment. Huntington Life Sciences was a big step up from a small private company with very little financial backing and even less public support to a much larger multinational firm with the backing of many rich and powerful people. The UK government intervened early on, making it illegal to demonstrate in front of the, um, the actual uh, laboratories themselves. And so the campaigners shifted their strategy and began targeting secondary and tertiary companies that supported HLS, such as their banks, their insurance company, even the people who picked up their trash. Under relentless campaign pressure, these companies one by one began refusing to deal with HLS. Stock in the company was delisted from the New York Stock Exchange after American activists exerted their own pressure in the United States. Publicly traded stock of HLS went from $30 a share to very amount of, into the amount of just pennies a share, and the company was weeks, if not days, away from bankruptcy. And just when it seemed that HLS would fold and 500 animals would no longer be tortured to death every single day, the UK and the US governments, after considerable pressure from their wealthy backers in the pharmaceutical business, stepped in and basically locked up everybody that was involved in the leadership of the campaign. Some activists persevered, but the campaign was mortally wounded and HLS was able to regain its footing and still continues to operate today. Other pressure campaigns have been and still are being waged successfully. In the UK, there's a vociferous campaign with hundreds of activists being waged against MBR Acres, owned by Marshall Bio Resources, a breeder of animals for vivisection. Currently, activists are maintaining a 24-hour permanent camp outside that facility, and blockades have prevented beagle dogs from being transported out of the under siege compound. Currently in America, these are some of the campaigns that uh, have been waged and, and, the, uh, and the notable results. Besides the ones I mentioned, there's also others. Again, the Shack campaign ultimately failed, but it did teach uh, a lot of activists all around the world, including myself and others in the United States, about how to wage these uh, pressure campaigns. Currently in America, the Camp Coalition to Abolish the Fur Trade, which was resurrected from the 1990s, has been targeting fur designers and purveyors 
pushing many to stop trading in the skins of these tortured animals. As you can see from the slide, a number of retailers and designers have stopped using fur since being targeted by this campaign. Canada Goose, Moose Knuckles, and Mackage all removed fur before they were even targeted by CAF after seeing what happened to some of their, uh, those other companies. Since this slide was made, Oscar de la Renta has also stopped um, dealing in fur products, and the campaign against Yves Saint Laurent continues. So in only a few months' time, activists at the Coalition to Abolish the Fur Trade have had numerous successes in getting companies to stop selling and designing fur. Here's a short video of a typical uh, recent in-store disruption against uh, Yves Saint Laurent. And this is part of the uh, campaign in which activists uh, make it uncomfortable for the stores to keep doing business as long as they're selling fur. Let me see if I can get the video to show. Successful pressure campaign, campaigns target vulnerable industries and companies, the low-hanging fruit, if you will, that often comes with built-in community support. The pre successful pressure campaigns recruit activists and build activist enthusiasm, confidence, and experience with small victories and then move on to bigger targets. Successful pressure campaigns utilize persistence and creativity to create a siege mentality such as sending black faxes, well, back in the day, nobody sends faxes anymore, uh, in-store disruptions like we've seen, and home demonstrations. As a siege mentality develops and abusers begin to take notice, and some, some will change their behavior. In many cases, pressure campaigns will also include secondary and tertiary targets in addition to the actual companies that abuse animals themselves. And they also embrace all forms of activism, including educational outreach, demonstrations, intimidation, and sometimes illegal direct action toward a common goal of putting an end to one particular focus of abuse. Switching gears for a moment, <clears throat> illegal direct action for animals involves breaking the law in clandestine fashion to either liberate animals or inflict economic sabotage on those who abuse animals for profit or pleasure. A lot of great thinkers and activists, even if they weren't animal advocates, have recognized the morality in refusing to obey the law. And here are a couple of quotes, one by Thoreau and one by Martin Luther King, Jr. And various laws at various times and various places have codified human slavery, the attempted genocide of humans, and continue to ensure the oppression of many people worldwide. The animals only have it magnitude is worse. As billions are enslaved, exploited, tortured, and murdered every year, it's all perfectly legal under the law. Legislation is not constant and has little basis in morality. Animal abuse is morally wrong in most forms. It's perfectly legal. And hence, therefore, I firmly believe that laws which protect such abusers may justifiably be ignored. The Animal Liberation Front is one of several underground organizations that break the law in order to help end animal exploitation. They have a set of guidelines that were agreed upon early uh, in their formation in the early 1970s England. Those guidelines include to liberate animals from conditions of abuse, to inflict economic sabotage upon those who do abuse animals, and to refrain from hurting any animal, human or non-human alike. Along the way, the ALF also exposes the suffering of abused animals and encourages others to take action to end that suffering. 
Cells in the ALF are typically formed by one or more persons who can trust each other implicitly, and they get together to help animals and operate under the above mentioned guidelines. And anybody that does that can then consider themselves part of the ALF. Uh, I'll play a short three minute video that made by somebody I don't know. Uh, it's widely available on YouTube and you may have seen it there. But it uh, gives a, uh, just a quick look at some types of ALF actions. Uh, some of them are a little bit outdated, uh, but um, it will uh, serve to give you an idea about the nature of these compassionate air quote Currently, the uh, ALF is active in dozens of countries around the world and can be credited over time with thousands of actions, the liberation of hundreds of thousands of imprisoned non-human animals, and the infliction of billions of dollars in economic damages to those who abuse animals for profit. These are some, uh, quickly I'll go through these slides, these are some uh, statistics that we compiled uh, over the last five years of, of total uh, reported uh, illegal direct action. and. I emphasize the word reported because for every action that's reported, there are undoubtedly other actions that go unreported. This is a slide by year, and you can 
see that the numbers are, this is only for half of the year at the, at the uh, for 2021, so um, the numbers will probably be about the same. This is uh, by region, and you can see the UK and um, uh, Western Europe have had the largest number of actions. North America, South America have been uh, sort of waning of late. They used to be a lot more active. There have been a lot of successes attributable to illegal direct action, as we see in this slide. America's only horse slaughter plant was closed down after it was burned uh, down in the late 1990s. A uh, company testing their product on animals, Palm Wonderful, stopped animal testing after their product was sabotaged. And numerous fur shops and uh, fur farms have gone out of business after being uh, uh, targeted with liberations and economic sabotage. Every successful struggle for liberation, both historical and concurrent, has depended on an arm of their struggle that utilized direct action, which is illegal under the current regime. The struggle for animal liberation has been the least violent liberation struggle in history. These are just some uh, examples of actions that have taken place within the last couple of years. Thousands of captive mink were liberated in uh, Idaho, uh, USA, these were 186 ducklings that were liberated from a faux bra farm in France. These were uh, just, uh, trucks that were destroyed in the Netherlands at a slaughterhouse. And this is right here in Luxembourg where 13 hunting towers were um, destroyed in memory of Mike Hill. Mike Hill was an anti-hunting activist in the UK that was intentionally run over and, and killed by a Hunter. There's um, no uh, shortage of criticisms of direct action, both illegal and legal. And I don't really have time to go into all of them right now. In fact, I'm starting to run short on time. But uh, I have been a, uh, I've been doing um, interviews with the media since 2004, so that's 17 years. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people in the mainstream media, and I can just tell you that as opposed to what some people think and say, that the coverage has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, long jail sentences uh, don't really uh, change this type of activism at all. Uh, very, very few people get caught uh, doing illegal direct action. There have been literally thousands of actions uh, done over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, and uh, only a handful of people have ever been arrested, and even fewer than that have ever gone uh, and done uh, long prison terms. <clears throat> they, they, the government tries to scare you by thinking that they're going to lock you up, but it, it, it's, it's so rare that it's almost remarkable. The government uh, can unleash its unlimited resources against activists, as we saw with the Shack campaign, where they not only bailed the company out by providing them with insurance services and banking services, but they also passed new laws to make it even more illegal to do what the activists were doing, and eventually they were able to arrest activists uh, on both sides of the pond and, and put an end to that. But in, in my opinion, when the government starts passing laws, especially against your campaign, or they start um, stepping in on behalf of the abusers, all that means is that you're having an effect on that, uh, on that industry, and that's um, it's a good sign in case when we do lose. I don't think it really portrays the opposition as victims. Uh, I don't think anybody is going to feel like a, an animal tester is a victim just because the animals have been uh, released from his laboratory. Other people talk about Gandhi and, and uh, Martin Luther King as being nonviolent activists and as um, somebody that we should try to emulate, but what's not talked about is that in addition to Gandhi, in addition to Martin Luther King, in addition to all of the other uh, nonviolent or, or peaceful activists, there were always other activists in the background that were willing to use uh, more stringent means. Some people say that ALF, or people who do illegal direct action, is um, uh, terrorism. Uh, terrorism has a lot of different definitions. It kind of depends on who wants to define it to, to serve their purposes, but it contains at least three specific conditions, and I'm quoting from uh, terrorist or freedom fighters, uh, edited by Stephen Best and Anthony Nocella, and that terrorism contains, uh, one, an intentional use of physical violence or threat of violence, 
two, directed against innocent persons, and three, for the ideological, political, or economic purposes of an individual organization or state government. So we can argue about the definition of violence, uh, whether sabotage against inanimate objects constitutes violence or not, but regardless, it's abundantly clear that the ALF and other underground organizations do not target innocent persons. They have not and, and, have, and never have. Uh, and they, by definition, then, cannot be considered terrorists. Those who perpetuate the suffering of animals by the billions, on the other hand, clearly use physical violence against innocent, non-human persons for usually economic purposes for themselves, their corporations, or their government. Animal exploitation is cumulatively the greatest act of terrorism ever committed and is ongoing each and every day. Animal abusers are the ones inflicting terror on millions daily. They are the terrorists. Uh, compassionate activists willing to risk their freedom to help innocent animals. So in conclusion, in conclusion, I'd like to posit the idea that we need all strategies as we travel the path to animal liberation. And while major wealthy animal advocacy groups may be necessary and, and may serve a purpose, it's grassroots campaigning that affects the real progress for the animals and is a far more efficient use, in my opinion, of an activist's time and resources. Many purportedly humane organizations strive to implement Try, strive to implement slightly larger cages, maybe with windows, or more humane slaughterhouses. And I don't believe it's productive to publicly demean other groups trying to help animals, but I do believe that as grassroots campaigners, we can put our efforts where they matter most and where the animals would want us to be on their behalf. And lastly, I'll just note that there have been a number of animal rights activists that have been martyred in the movement. This is a, a partial list. Uh, Reagan Russell was uh, hit by a truck, uh, run over by a truck at a slaughterhouse um, about a year ago. Barry Horn uh, died on a hunger strike in a UK prison. Jill Phipps was also struck by a slaughterhouse truck. Tom Warby, Mike Hill, and William Sweet were all killed by hunters um, during hunt sabotage. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I'll be around uh, the next couple days at the uh, Animal 